Have you ever wondered why we focus so much on tau protein and tau tangles while all the tests currently on all the therapies are really looking into these proteins and how it works? Well, basically this video from the AIC conference and the Monday's plenary session will explain to you why these tau tangles is really bad for your brain and why all the researchers nowadays focusing on Alzheimer's are really focusing on this protein. Dr. Maria Grazia Spilantini from Cambridge will reveal how tau proteins don't just kill those neurons directly. They turn our brain support cell into accomplices in destruction. So if you ever wonder how this works, watch this video. All right, in the second part of this plenary, we're turning to Dr. Maria Grazia Spilantini's presentation on tau pathology, which reveals mechanisms of neurodegeneration that are equally groundbreaking, but completely different from the fibrin story. Dr. Spilantini was part of the legendary team at Cambridge MRC Laboratory in Molecular Biology, working alongside Nobel laureates that first identified what those mysterious tangles in Alzheimer's brain were actually made of. So what came up was that Michel prepared a cDNA library, a human brain, and then using a fragment extracted by Claude, he was able to screen this library and identified a protein that was present in the paradelical filament. And this protein was the protein tau. So tau, a protein that normally helps maintain in the structure of our neurons by stabilizing microtubules, the cellular highways that transfer nutrients and signals. In a healthy brain, tau acts like railroad ties, keeping the tracks straight and stable. But here's how it becomes a killer. And so tau, at some point, become hyperphosphorylated, and phosphorylation regulates the ability of tau to bind to microtubules. So phosphorylated tau doesn't bind well anymore, becomes accumulating, start accumulating the cytoplasm until at some point the concentration becomes such that you have the first nucleus of aggregation and then the rest of the protein start to aggregate to form these uh, small aggregates and then the characteristic paradelical filament. Think of it like a traffic jam that starts with one stalled car and eventually blocks the entire highway. Normal tau has specific phosphorylation sites that regulate its function, but in disease it becomes high hyperphosphorylated at abnormal sites, up to 45 different phosphorylation sites compared to just two to three in a healthy tau. This hyperphosphorylated tau can't do its job, it hatches from microtubules and start clumping together. But what proved tau's importance wasn't just finding it in Alzheimer's brain, it was discovering families with tau mutation. But then a group of family was identified where mutation indeed were also in the tau gene. But this family did not present with Alzheimer's. They showed different form of dementia that is a frontotemporal dementia and that affects not the brain like I've shown you earlier but mainly affects the frontal part of the brain. This was the smoking gun. How mutations alone without any amyloid involvement could cause dementia. This mutation in the map in the MAPT gene on chromosome 17 proved how isn't just a bystander but the primary driver of neurodegeneration. Different mutation creates different patterns of damage affecting different brain regions or even different cells Times. So we know that Alzheimer's disease, Down syndrome, dementia pugilistica, among others, they all have a, a tau deposit in neurons and they have the characteristic filaments, paradelical filaments, straight filaments, but they all contain the six tau isoform. Peak disease, frontotemporal dementia instead, the characteristic peak bodies and the filaments look different at the electron microscope and they have mainly tau it re repeats. So the human brain produces six different versions of tau through alternative splicing, some with three microtubule binding repeats, so those are the three R tau, other with four repeats, which are the four R tau. Different diseases show preferential aggregation of different isoforms, creating distinct pathological signature visible even at the molecular level through cryo-electron microscopy. But here's where Dr. Spilantini's research takes an unexpected turn. When they tried to rescue dying neurons by transplanting healthy neural stem cells, something bizarre happened. And we found that indeed these green cells had become 
some astrocytes. So why we have so many astrocytes proliferating in the brain of these mice? Why they are not able to rescue the phenotype? And what we found was that the astrocytes are dysfunctional. So they are unable to support the neurons. The stem cells that were supposed to become neurons turned into astrocytes instead. And astrocytes are those star-shaped support cells that normally nurture neurons, regulate neurotransmitters, maintain the blood-brain barrier, and provide metabolic support. But these astrocytes were broken. They couldn't do their job. And remember, the astrocytes themselves don't have tau pathology. They are being poisoned remotely by toxic signals from nearby neurons with tau tangles. And the team discovered what was missing. So there are various factors that could be missing, but we decided to test thrombospondin, that is a glycoprotein that is involved in synaptic formation. And indeed, we could rescue this uh, loss of activity of the astrocytes that we had observed. Then we did proteomics, and we found that, again, thrombospondin was a protein reduced in these transgenic mice compared to the control mice. So thrombospondin, a protein crucial for forming and maintaining synapses, acting like a molecular glue that helps neurons connect properly. When tau pathology develops, thrombosporin production crashes and our brain's support system fails. This creates a vicious circle. Damaged neurons can't get support from astrocytes, leading to more neuronal stress and more tau pathology. This is a completely different mechanism from the fibrin story, but equally important for understanding how our brains deteriorate. But the most shocking discovery was how neurons actually die in tau pathology. And we found found that indeed this neuron phosphatidyl serine that attract the microglia and the microglia as shown here eat these neurons while they are still alive. And then after that, the microglia start to release fragments of tau, enhancing spreading of the tau pathology. But at the same time, the microglia doesn't function anymore. They become dysfunctional. This is horrifying, right? Our brain's immune cells are literally eating living neurons through a process called phagoptosis. The stressed neurons display phosphatidylserine on the surface. Normally, this IDME signals only appears on dead cells. The tau pathology causes it to flip to the outside while neurons are still active. Microglia respond by consuming them whole, then these microglia spread tau fragments to other parts of the brain before becoming senescent themselves, expressing markers like P21. It's like a zombie apocalypse that is happening right in our brain, where the defenders become spreaders of the disease. So in our Phoenix community discussion, we often talk about the importance of supporting our brain's immune system. This research shows why both fibrin and tau pathology corrupt our microglia turning protectors into destroyers. Understanding these mechanisms helps us appreciate why comprehensive approaches to brain health, managing inflammation, supporting glial cell function, and maintaining vascular health are so important for us apoe for carriers. For developing new treatments, Dr. Spilantini's team has created something remarkable. And so we have produced cortical organoids from human iPS cells, and these are from controlled subjects, and we have infected them with filaments from brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease or with a recombinant fragment of tau and then after 129 days the infection we find very very abundant aggregates of tau. Brain organoids, miniature human brains grown from induced pluripotent stem cells that self-organize into 3D structure with multiple cell types. After about four months they develop the same tau tangles we see in Alzheimer's patients. These organoids can even show the six-layered structure of the human cortex making them powerful model for drug testing. And these organoids prove something critical about how tau spreads. And we know that they reclude the endogenous tau because you don't get this if there is no tau in the cells, but also because in this case, you can label the filaments by a tau antibody that is not present for an epitope not present in this fragment. The corrupted tau acts like a template, recruiting normal tau protein and converting them to toxic forms through a process called templated seeding. It's a prion-like mechanism, one misfolded protein corrupting all the others around it, spreading from cell to cell. This explains why tau pathology follows predictable patterns through the brain as described by Bragg staging, starting in the entorhinal cortex 
and spreading outward. So what we've learned today from Dr. Spilantini is how she revealed how Tao doesn't just form tangles, it corrupts our brain's entire support system, turning helpful astrocytes dysfunctional and causing microglia to eat living neurons before becoming senescent spreaders of pathogen cells. Now you know why you really don't want to have Tau tangles in your brain and why so many tests out there are only testing for that. This is particularly important because tau protein is really targetable and measurable, so we can actually treat, we can measure, we can see disease progression. As always, keep learning, keep fighting, and remember, we're not just carriers of risk, we're carriers of resilience. And together with the Phoenix community and through channels like this, YouTube, we are turning cutting-edge science into practical action that you can use today. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Shrine, and have a great day.